Hey everyone, today we will be discussing about the world's most wanted hacker, Kevin Metnick, and his transformation from a black hat hacker to a white hat hacker. Growing up, Kevin developed a deep interest for a computer science radio and even little pranks. One of these pranks, which you will later recall as his favorite, was when he hacked into McDonald's drive-thru. In the order window, he would simply replace the worker's voice as his own voice and then say something ridiculous, such as, You're the hundredth customer today. Your order is absolutely free. Please drive forward. But my hands down favorite is when the cops would drive up. Hide the hide the So this manager of the McDonald's runs out into the parking lot and he's trying to figure out who's messing with the system. He's looking all around, doesn't see a thing. He look, actually looks into some of the cars. No one's in the car. And he eventually walks over to the McDonald's drive-up window speaker, bends over and peers inside, as if somebody's hiding in the speaker, and I key down my radio and go, what the hell are you looking at? And this guy flies back about five feet. But things got bigger when he was 16 and was in a group of fellow hackers. They dared him to hack a computer system named as The Ark owned by the Digital Equipment Corporation. If you're enjoying the content so far, don't forget to hit the like button, share your thoughts into the comments below, and most importantly, subscribe for more internet stories like this. Kevin was a teenage whiz kid, a phone freak, a black hat, the FBI's most wanted hacker, a fugitive, a prisoner, a citizen who was banned from using computers. And from all of it became a rehabilitated white hat with his computer privileges restored, a keynote speaker, a trainer, a high-profile penetration tester, and an author. In his early age, as he loved pulling pranks with friends and family, which made him more fascinated by the technology of Blue Box, which was a device that emits multi-frequency tones, and it was used when the phone company was using man's signal back in 80s and 90s to control the phone company's network. So, by learning about it, he played many pranks, one of which was modifying his friend's phone to a pay phone. So, whenever his friend's parents try to make a call, it says, please deposit 25 cents and the furious friends calls him to change it back, otherwise he would get it grounded. Similarly to Steve Jobs, he also had a hobby of phone freaking in the mid of 1970s and this was not illegal at that time. So to be a better prankster, he started learning how to gain more access to phone company network and when the phone companies were moving on towards from electromechanical switching and step by step in crossbar over to electronic switching which was controlled by front end computers and this transformation made him to start his foray for hacking by hacking the phone companies. When he first got into trouble and ended up in a court for the bail hearing, the federal prosecutor stated that not only Kevin should be held without bail, but also should not get the access to a phone. And when asked by the judge why it is so, the prosecutor went on to say, well, Mr. Mitnick could pick the phone, dial up to NORAD, which is the Northern Air Defense, and whistle into the phone to communicate with modem and launch a nuclear weapon. After being held up for a year, he figured that the government would do it again, and this made him more fugitive for three years with an attitude of catch me if you can. Government was chasing him again and again because of his fascination with how a cell phone worked which led him to hack a phone company network and get a source code to the firmware on the chip inside so he can study and understand how it worked and this became kind of a trophy for him. Rather than studying codes, he preferred a mobile magazine and he went down the list of all the different cell phone manufacturers that existed back in the day and hacked all of them as a trophy. There were more trophy hunting and eventually the cell phone companies couldn't figure out how it happened because he stored the source code on a server of USC, a university in LA and one of the admins found it and informed the FBI and FBI took out the list of all the companies and informed him. So Kevin was the number one suspect because of his fame in this area. He was dubbed as the most wanted computer hacker in the world by investigators. At that time, authorities believed that he had access to corporate trade secrets worth millions of dollars. In 1993, he played cat and mouse game with FBI by watching them through their cellular phone system to keep a track of where they were. So if they got close to the Kevin, he would go farther away. 
At one point, they raided what they thought was Mr. Mitnick's home, only to find that there a Middle Eastern immigrant watching TV. On another occasion, using a radio scanner and software, Mitnick discovered that FBI agents were closing in on him. He fled his apartment, and when the authorities arrived, they found a box of donuts waiting for them. He had bypassed the security systems of the government and more than 100 corporations like Motorola, Sun Microsystems, and Pacific Bells. Kevin ran into a trouble on Christmas Day in 1994 when he stole emails from a fellow hacker named Shimomura and taunted him. When he learned of the attack, Shimomura suspended a cross-country ski trip he was on and volunteered to help track him down. And his arrest sparked a free cabin movement in the hacking community, which lobbied on his behalf, including with the rallies outside the prison where he was held and charged with a lot of illegal use of telephone, access device, and computer fraud. After being released from custody, three months later, Joseph Liverman and Fred Thompson invited him to Congress to testify on how the federal government could better protect their computer systems and he got permission from the probation department to travel to Washington where he submitted written testimony and had a jump start in his career as a white hat hacker. He naturally fell for security consulting because the only difference between black hat hacking and ethical hacking is simply the authorization from the client. Now you might be thinking, what kind of Pablo Escobar became a pharmacist? But over here, as he never had a motive to make money or harm anyone, and for him hacking was all about prank tourism, and the knowledge he gained out of it as the ethical hacking was also kind of a trophy for him, he wrote that anyone who loves to play chess knows that it's enough to defeat your opponent. You don't have to look at his kingdom or seize his assets to make it worthwhile. As a white hat hacker, he aimed to use his skills and identify vulnerabilities and security issues of organizations to test security configurations. And soon Kevin was catalyst of the information security industry. In 2003, he founded Mitnick Security Consulting, which advised Fortune 500 companies and government agencies on cybersecurity. They maintained a 100% success rate of being able to penetrate the security of any system they are paid to hack into using a combination of technical exploits and social engineering. And by 2011, he became chief hacking officer and part owner of Know Before, which offers phishing security awareness, security training. The company says that a cybersecurity training curriculum that Mitnick designed is used by more than 60,000 organizations. He denied using his skills to steal or exploit information for financial gain in his 2011 memoir, Ghost in the Wires. He has been also subjected of countless stories, myths, movies, books, and also in theaters in a film of Werner Hergos, and was also syndicated in Geographic Channel in a series called I Am Rebel in 107 countries. KPMG has compared him to David Beckham or LeBron James uh, because he's truly one of the superstars in cybersecurity and his stories are truly legendary. We lost him due to pancreatic cancer in July 2023. Kevin will always remain the world's most famous hacker and will be renowned for his intelligence, humor, and extraordinary skill with technology, surpassed only by his talent as the original social engineer. And that's a wrap for today's internet story with Saksham. Don't forget to drop some comments and I will see you tomorrow with another interesting story. But that's it for today. I'll see you. We ain't going out like that. We ain't going out like that. Watch me go and bounce swipe back. We ain't going out like that. I guess some things never change. Like my pops being stuck in his ways.